race, ethnicity, and democracy in Trinidad, Guyana, and Fiji from the perspective of the youth. Don't go anywhere. Carbonate. I'm David Hines. As you know, we have talked several times on this program on the issue of race and ethnicity in Guyana and Trinidad. We have had a number of panels. Well, today we're going to have a different perspective. We're going to have a perspective from a young person who has just completed her PhD. Her dissertation was on race and ethnicity in Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Fiji. Dr. Stacy Ann Wilson is our guest on today's program. Dr. Wilson. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Carb Nation. Well, you have recently graduated from Howard University, the Mecca for Caribbean people. It seems um, so. And um, you, your PhD uh, is in political science. In particular, your dissertation uh, looked at uh, race and ethnicity in Guyana. Trinidad and Tobago and Fiji, so mm -hmm. uh, it's relevant to the situation. We've dealt with that issue a lot on this program mm. before. W what got you interested in studying race and ethnicity to begin with? Well, I had uh, a previous visit to Trinidad just when uh, Basdeo Pande came into office, and I was just on vacation, but at the time, I, I was actually an undergraduate at the time, People just kept arguing and sniping about how, you know, an Indian government came to power and everything is Trinidad has changed, the place has gone to this, that, and the other, and how they want to import buffaloes from India. And it's just a lot of acrimony, but I didn't understand it because I wasn't really aware of the racial situation in Trinidad. And as I matured academically, you know, scholastically, went through the process, I started thinking, <coughs> This would make for a very interesting dissertation topic, or at least a research project, if you compared it with its neighbor, Guyana, who's having similar problems, but in a different way, and with you know, another country, preferably an island, because that's where I would like to go, um, <laughs> you know, in another region. And Fiji came up with the sort of same kinds of problems, and so it made for a very interesting comparison. So that's what, sort of how the three kind of came together for me. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you didn't understand Trinidad, although you're Caribbean, so you're born in Jamaica. I'm Jamaican, All yeah. All right, so walk us through um, that whole thing. You were born in Jamaica, which part of Jamaica, the, the oh, whole story. Boy. So the Jamaicans <laughs> out there in the list, the, the viewing audience will probably... Um, they probably know me know from you. the bad yes. deeds I've done. <laughs> but yeah, I'm born in Jamaica. My parents migrated to Bermuda when I was probably about 10. Um, and my, my parents are nurses. And so we moved to Jamaica, I mean, moved from Jamaica to Bermuda. I was at Harborview Primary School, so I was, I'm a Kingstonian. I went to Camperdown uh, High School, uh -huh. Kingstonian. Uh -huh. um, and uh, then in Bermuda, we had, Bermuda has, interestingly enough, the reason I didn't include Bermuda, it would have been an interesting comparison, but Bermuda is a colony, so I didn't want to use colonial societies. I want to look at post colonial societies mm -hmm. because Bermuda also has similar problems in terms of racial issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I was introduced to it in Bermuda, but not in the same way, because in Bermuda it's a black-white white. situation, yes, yes. not color on color as it is in the, in the, on the three countries I discussed. But, so from Bermuda, we go to Toronto. Mm -hmm. And in Toronto, I finished my high school experience and started university. Mm -hmm. I went to York University in Toronto and then did my master's at Carleton in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I came to the US for a different experience and went to Howard. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my traveling extravaganza. But the race relations issue, being Jamaican, uh, we have East Indians in our population, but not in any sort of way where we, are, we have an antagonistic relationship. Um, the population is small in mm -hmm. the first place. And, you know, our problems are shadism, you know, right, right. light skin, dark skin, mm -hmm, da, da, mm -hmm. da, da. We could care less what race or creed you're from. Mm -hmm. If you're light skin, you're good. If you're dark skin, you're not. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just how we sort of break it down. So Trinidad presented a very different experience because as a Caribbean person, you were always taught 
that Trinidad is this mosaic place where everybody is and everybody gets along. So to go there in the, you know, the 90s and realize, oh, it's really not the way it is, it, it was, it was a sort of a new, mm -hmm. new little you mm -hmm. know, thing. So. Why did you come to Howard? Howard, because I, as living in Bermuda, we, I went to an all-black school okay. called Berkeley, uh, or Barclay as the locals call it, but spell Berkeley, uh -huh. anyhow. Uh -huh. uh, Barclay Institute, and it's an all-black school that was positioned against an all-white school, predominantly white high school, uh, which if you had money as a black person, you would tend to go there too. But Barclay was a middle class or upper middle class um, high school in Bermuda, and there we were introduced to some of the black universities in the U.S. because mm -hmm. it was a black school. The, the American historically black colleges would want to recruit from that school, so Morehouse, Spelman, Howard, and Howard being one of them. Um, so I was always intrigued by Howard, yes. not really knowing what it was about, but this idea that there was a group of people you could sit with and chat, you know, there are a lot of people of color there and all that kind of stuff. So when you finish school out of a Canadian predominantly white universities, you're thinking, where would I go next? You know, where would I cut my teeth where people understand the kind of things where, where I was coming from? Because, you know, you're so used to being the only person of color in a class setting, mm -hmm. particularly in politics. Yeah. And you have viewpoints that are sort of third world labeled mm -hmm. and nobody understands what you mean. So you think, well, I thought in any case that coming to Howard would give me an opportunity to engage with people from the sort of same kind of background who understand the issues that people of color are presenting, not just from a North American perspective, but the Caribbean and Africa, you know. Your research took you to Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Fiji. Let's um, talk a little bit about your experience in Guyana. Um, what, 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 what you found there? Well, Guyana was interesting because I thought it would be my, one of the difficult project, part of the project, because I'd never been. I had heard all the horror stories one could ever hope to hear about traveling to, you know, a place, you know, violence, be careful where you put your wallet, you know, being Jamaican, of course, I, we're stuck with the same stereotypes, <laughs> but it was like, well, you know, J Kingston, Jamaica is nothing to Georgetown is what, you know, like my mom, for instance, was like, are you sure you want to go there? I have a coworker who's been, you know, hasn't been back to Guyana in like 20 years because it's so violent. Mm. So that was my first kind of, ah. mm -hmm. but then I get there and everyone I interviewed or met was so down to earth and uh, they made the process so easy, you know, the, the, regardless of what side of the, the fence they were, whether they were PNC or PPP, each of them shuttled me sometimes from one party meeting to another yeah. without any animosity with, with me. I mean, of course, they have animosity with each other. Um, so that experience was great. Um, I got access to people I didn't think I would get access to, like the opposition leader, you know, the president of the Bar Association, and, you know, some, some higher ups, as they say, <laughs> um, which was, was, was very essential because, you know, these are the brokers in the situation. So that was, that was good. Um, the people of Guyana, the general everyday folk, were just disgusted. I mean, there's no other word to use, but disgusted, disgusted with, the, with, with the, the situation. With the political situation yeah, just there, disgusted. Yeah. It, it, uh -huh. it's, there's, they seem to have, they have no faith in their political leaders. Um, they don't think that whatever they have to contribute matters anyway. They kind of go along with the process that's in place, knowing full well it won't make them better, but they don't have a choice. So they seem like they don't have options. Well, explain, explain that, because it, it's a contradiction of, in, in a sense, eh? Yeah. Um, explain that contradiction for us. So the thing is, what I found among Guyanese was that, on the one hand, they knew that their, they see that their predicament, they cannot be better out of the situation that they're in but they're not really presented as a population with alternatives because the alternatives are always at the level of government to be discussed. Okay. Now or at a later date, yeah. it never trickles down to people discussing it. It's always the top level and the top will bring it down. Now, even at the level where people try to bring it up, there is like a ceiling in, in some instances. So people don't feel that their, vo their voice matters. So their version of dealing with the situation is flight. So, they just so, leave. Yeah, but there are two issues you're raising there. There is the racial issue, mm -hmm. but you're also raising the issue of democracy. Yeah. That is that ordinary people Don't feel are like they have a say. not part of the decision making. So we have what? The convergence of race and ethnicity on the one hand, race and ethnicity and authoritarianism. And, and, authoritarianism. Yeah. and that makes for an interesting mix. Makes for a horrible and situation. And I think it's an important point you're making because often Guyana is described 
either way. It's either described as this authoritarian mm -hmm. state on the Burnham, mm -hmm. or it's described as this state where you have racial problems. It's both. And, not the, and, and the, the convergence yeah, is not it's, always it's both. presented. It's, it's very difficult to see Guyana, for me in any case, to see Guyana as one removed from the other. It is a racial state, unfortunately. It's yeah. what it has become. And it's an authoritarian state. And I think, I don't recall really a history in Guyana where it wasn't an authoritarian state. Exactly. You know, it, it, that's what it is. Yeah. And people want transparency and they want democracy, but only insofar as they win. It is not that they want it for the other people. They want it for themselves. For themselves. <laughs> so, so power is constructed in terms of party, race, and the party and is self. the race, and the race is the party <laughs> and the individuals. In, there well, you go. So let's switch to Trinidad now. And Trinidad and Tobago. Do you find the same thing in Trinidad and Tobago, or do you do you find something different? Well, in Trinidad, it's a little bit different because they seem to be committed to the idea of democracy at the local level. The problems in Trinidad stem less from politics and more from culture. And this is what my dissertation was kind of flesh out: that when you talk to politicians in Trinidad, it's not that they're not committed to do the democratic process. They seem to very much be. What is at issue is the brokers within a particular segment of the population, of the Indian and the black population, who think they deserve special treatment, or on the Indian side, not that they deserve special treatment, they equal treatment. And so the Hindu, the Orthodox Hindus in Trinidad are vying for what they're, they're arguing is equality. They feel that their religion or their cultural norms have been discriminated against in a you know a dominantly Christian society. That although you know in their anthem or whatever says every creed finds an equal place or whatever, it in fact that's not true. So their argument is that we are not equal. Yes, we may have money, and the you know Indians may have money, and blacks have the political power, but culturally we're not equal. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, carnival for instance is more important than other festivals in the national symbol. So that's the argument there. It's not so much it's a political issue, but politicians have been very savvy about co-opting cultural issues and making them political. Mm. Like, you know, for every society, right, everything right. is political. So they've been able to, to word it in a way where people rally behind politicians based on these cultural, these cultural symbols and make it a political issue and say, well, blacks aren't giving us power because, or Indians aren't giving us power because. So they, they tend to utilize it in that way. But I think Trinidadians have been so entrenched in the political process, the democratic process, much more so than the politicians. Mm -hmm. So that you find that... Ho, oh, oh. ho. Trinidadians, for instance, are very apt to vote for a multi-ethnic party. And they will form them on the ground in ma en masse, so to speak. But it's but only NAR was the experience in yeah, 86. That they've had. So they, they, yeah. And it's the, po the politicians that split, not the people. Uh -huh. Right? So the people are still always in support of the idea of having coalitions. Uh -huh. They're always in, the, in the, the idea that we know that one segment of the population cannot rule. But you'd notice it in the amount of mixed relations. Mm -hmm. You know, the Calypsonian says that um, Trinidad, Trinidadians. Uh, segregate by day but integrate by night uh -huh. yeah and it's true you look in the population you can't even identify what racial group most of the people but let me are. take you back to the beginning of the program where you said <clears throat> when you were first in Trinidad when you first visited Trinidad and Indian government had come to power mm -hmm. in 95 in 95 yeah. for the first time the first time and there was this expression of fear on the part of, of both groups of, of explain yeah. that on, on the Indian side, the, because the, who came to power was an Orthodox Hindu. So on the Indian side, Muslim Indians were f fearful that it become this Hindu country. All right, okay. Which would prime Hindu cultural symbols. Okay. Muslims, right. for, historically, have been able to side with Christian black Trinidadians. Yes, the, the Muslims voted PNM. Right. right. And, and culturally, they, they have the same, I mean, they don't have the same God and Bible and all that, but they, they have the same cultural symbols because Muslims are more creolized. Yeah. And Trinidad, you know, Afro Trinidadians are titled Creole, while Indians, particularly Hindus, don't want to be called Creole. They want to maintain this mother India, you know, sort of, sort of identity, whereas it's not the case for Muslims. So you had that resistance. And on the other end, you had afro trinidadians who were, say, naturally resistant to the idea that they were no longer in power. Right. Um, so you had, you had resistance from both ends. Politics and power 
and race and then within the group. Cultural. Cultural. Yeah. So whereas in Guyana it's um it's just power, culture, not well not culture, it's but race. it's power, race and, yeah. and, and, and authoritarianism. Yeah, um exactly. Fiji is not part of the Caribbean. It's not in terms of the demographics the same as Trinidad and and, and, and Ghana, but it's interesting. It's interesting because yeah. there's a large uh, Aboriginal population. I mean, Guyana has an Aboriginal population too, which is one of the reasons why Fiji was interesting because the Aboriginal population in Fiji has decided, well, and historically, that they are the natives of the land and the land will not be taken from them. They own nine, more than 90% of the land, which can only be leased, it can never be sold. So they have ownership, there's a mm -hmm. sense of ownership. And my curiosity has always been, will the population in Guyana, the Aboriginal population, be strong enough? Because, since, really, you have both populations declining, uh, Indians and Africans, as they're migrating at such a rapid you know, uh, rate, that will the native population in Guyana... Well, the native population in Guyana is 6%, which is yeah. way, 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 way yeah, below. Yeah, but it's growing. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's yes. It's a technically yeah, growing population. Yeah, but they themselves are migrating to, well, to yeah, Venezuela to, and right, Brazil and right. so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, but see, so. the movements <clears throat> in the neighboring countries is that, you know, Ecuador, for example, a very strong indigenous movement. So these all always have domino effects. So the question is, will they become strong enough I mean, even with a 6% population, I mean, they're less than that in Canada and they have their own province. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you yeah. don't need, you know, 20, 30% to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You just need to be aggressive, I think is what it is. And I, I wonder whether or not with the movements happening in the neighboring countries, whether or not um, the Guyanese native population will be that. But in Fiji, it was interesting because you have, again, an, an Indian population who came in as, you know, uh, indentured labor or whatever. Um, but... Fiji makes for a very interesting case because the Fijians, which are the native uh, of Fiji, were protected by the British. They were not allowed to be used as slave labor. And so there's a, there's a whole other uh, colonial policy set in place to protect them, including the protection of their land. But despite all this, Fijians are still at the bottom of the barrel, so to mm -hmm. speak. They own the land, but they, don't, they own very little else. Um, they control politics, and every attempt to get them out of the political sphere has been met by resistance, being they've coups. had three coups. Yeah. Um, so there is that sense of defiance and non-commitment to democracy, but Fijians have never claimed that they were. So, you know, for them it's no contradiction that if they are not in power, they will ensure that they are in power, because they're not committed to the idea of democracy in the first place. They're committed to indigenous paramountcy. So, they could care less about the transparency of democracy. They do that sort of to appease the rest of the world, mm -hmm. it seems. Mm -hmm. but. I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm coining my, in my head the term racial democracy. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, uh, and I intend to include in the title of something that I'm writing at the moment. <laughs> I, because I, I'm, I'm very firm on the, that the racial situation cannot be solved in non-democratic terms. Right. And, and so therefore, as you fight for racial equality, in a sense, you're fighting right. for democracy. Yeah, Dominican Republic and Brazil have sort of used that to define how they've moved forward. Uh, Brazilians, you know, this whole idea that you're a Brazilian, you're not an Afro, not a whatever, but you're a Brazilian. Hmm. Um, it's an attempt at that, but it's, I think it's at best intellectual dishonesty because you do have people fighting for recognition to, you know, not because they want special treatment necessarily, but mm. they want cultural balance, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it depends on how, it depends on how you define democracy too, because mm. some people only define it in terms of political realm, mm -hmm. where, you know, for me, democracy has to include things, equity on the economic level yes, and economic equity at the cultural right. level. Yes, so, yes, yes. you know, it's not just having the right to vote, which seems to be the, the, the political norm in the North that if you give someone the right to vote, they have democracy. And if you give them the right to vote and they voted, mm -hmm. that democracy is complete. Uh, but, and in that sense, Guyana is a democracy yeah, because oh, people don't have the right democracy. to vote. But <laughs> what the, 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 the um, returns, the outcome of right. a democratic vote is really an undemocratic process. state, an right. undemocratic yeah. process. Is there hope for Guyana? There's always hope. It's, it's bad to say that there's no hope because then what do people work towards? Um, there, there is absolutely hope, but the hope has to come from at the, the, the level of the grassroots. Do you see any, did you see any signs when you were there? The, I saw signs, but they, the resistance, you know, it's, it's sort of very touchy because the resistance is violent rather than uh, a peaceful sort of process. 
And there's a historical reason for that, obviously, is that everything in Guyana, if you resist, then, you know, somebody there, the natural reaction for the police and for the government is to, you know, to, to repress it. Um, but there, there is hope. There can always be hope because there are people still continuing to be educated. Um, people are becoming much more aware and much more astute to their situation. So there has to be, because if, they, if you tell a Guyanese that there is no hope, you've just doomed their future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you tell a student who's at the University of Guyana that when you graduate, this is it for you? You, don't, you, you Just look outwards. Mm -hmm. I read your dissertation, yeah. and um, you discuss one of the things that is, that is being talked about in Guyana, and also to a less extent in Trinidad. It's been a reality of some degree in, in Fiji, and that is the question of these um, competing forces, these competing parties, um, rather than have them compete over government power, one winning and one staying in the opposition, that you have an arrangement where both parties sit in the executive arm of government, so what they call power sharing. Mm -hmm. um, you weren't very <laughs> optimistic about power sharing. Um, um, the reason being, yeah. I mean, the reason for not being too optimistic about power sharing is because you leave it at the level of government. And the Guyanese experience has taught me, if nothing else, that nobody's going to give up power to suit the needs of any other group. You know, you have to, the, the situation is you have to fight for it. And it has to be fought for at the grassroots level. Politicians don't give up power. It's not one of the things, you know, we, they, whoever you want to classify as politicians, they're known for. So it has to be demanded at the level of the people, of the citizenship, um, that has to demand for power sharing, but in a different way. Having executive power sharing is not going to solve the problem. As by far itself? As, by, no, right. not going to solve the problem. Because you still have to deal with people. Mm -hmm. People and their personalities and their egos and yeah. their power tripping and their whatever. You have to have mechanisms in place yeah. from the grass. And I think one of the things you, you talk about, um, the sort of comprehensive power sharing where you know, NGOs are involved, you know, the level of civil society. You have to build trust in people. So, for instance, you cannot have a situation where people go on strike because their basic level of, of uh, living is demeaned, and then you get the police after them for expressing their democratic right. Mm -hmm. You're not uh, opening for an environment of democratization. What you're telling people is that it's my way or no way. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, you know, whether it's... No, no matter who is in power, they're both going to have the same attitude towards labor dis 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 disputes. Nobody's in the uh, habit of saying, okay, we'll give them exactly what they want, not even in the North. Mm -hmm. You fight for everything. Mm -hmm. But at least in the North, there is a perception that you don't just go after them just because they're on strike. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't just target people or you don't politicize it. You don't have a politician from the Democratic Party go out on the front lines when the car, you know, car makers are on strike, mm -hmm. you let them dispute. You don't right, make it political. Right, right, right. You know, and this is what's missing in the, in the Guyana case, is mm -hmm. that politicians have a tendency to go where they're not necessarily needed. Yeah, yeah. And well, you know, the party-centered um, uh, process that we have in the Caribbean, and it's taken to um, tremendous um, lengths in, in, in Guyana. Let's spend the next couple of minutes talking about you. Oh, wow. Um, how, yeah, how well, why not? I mean, you um, <laughs> just graduated, you were a PhD. Were you one of those that your parents um, knew that you were going to be a doctor or a lawyer? Well, they, the lawyer part, absolutely, <laughs> because they said I talk too much. I'm uh -huh. always arguing with them about something, so I had to be, you know, as Caribbean people, having a PhD, unless you were from a very educated family, that's not something that seems reachable because you don't even know what it is. Right. I mean, something you're, doing, you're doing a doctorate, they think you're going to be an MD. That's right. the first thing. Exactly. I mean, it's like, so you're going to be doing, where are you going to, what hospital are you going to be working at? You're like, uh, no, I'm a doctor of the mind. You, know, <laughs> like, you didn't explain that very well, but... Um, but they always expected great things, you know. They weren't quite sure what it would be because I had so many interests, you know, from politics. I was, you know, I've been student government since forever, you know, from mm -hmm. form captain to student president in Canada, you know, in Toronto when I was in school, uh, to the point where nobody ran against me the second year. Uh, you know, so okay. I felt, felt a little authoritarian uh, there. Uh, <laughs> but um, so I, I've always been interested in politics. It's always been one of the things that has sparked me. And I've had parents who were open enough, thank goodness, to talk to me about everything. You know, and being Jamaican, and most Jamaicans are hyper political, mm -hmm. even when they don't mean to be. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so we always had that conversation at home. And so that always, you know, my master's thesis was on Jamaica, because mm -hmm. you know the violence had broken out in Tivoli, and I'm like, I have to go and see what it's about. And and they were like, Are you sure you want to be doing that? 
but they were there anyway. They supported uh -huh. the process. And, you know, to this point now, where uh -huh. it's, they're pa all happy. Part it's of over. the problem mm -hmm. with you academics and... Um, oh, boy. <laughs> ...is that you tend to get lost in your books and your classrooms and <laughs> forget that um, there are people whose experiences you actually take. Your dissertation was about people's lives yeah. and people's experiences. Yeah. But you, you never give them, we never give them back to the people, you never give back. Well, that's experience. one of my, the things I'm trying to correct. Right, okay. um, by, I mean, in Guyana, I was actually um, trying to set up, and I actually still am, I'm just using the summer to sort of sort out myself, but to set up a situation where you can go back and have a conversation with all, I mean, I had discussion groups of people who took their time to come in and sit down. They would, I'm sure, would like to see the product of what, what happened. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm in contact with them by, by like cards and emails or whatever, mm -hmm. as to, you know, I've finished the process, I'd love to come back and have a little chat. Even the Secretary General of the PPP yes. invited Ramata, me, yeah, yeah. Ramatar yeah. invited yeah. me to come back and give some sort of a, a little talk mm -hmm. as to what my outcome from the, the Guyana case. And the same is true for, for Trinidad and Tobago and for Fiji. Mm -hmm. um, particularly for Fiji, where I was taken in by a community. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, it has to be that I give back something um, because the point was about telling people's story. So I'd like to, them to hear what their story turned out to be like. Uh, to all those young people who are looking at this program, um, who are in high school or in undergraduate, talk to, them. talk to them. Look, the first and foremost, have six goals. You know, you don't have just one that you're working towards because you know you're way more talented and multifaceted than that. So have a few things you want to work on so that when you get to university, you have a couple of options. Don't box yourself into a situation when you, a, lot of, a lot of my students, undergraduates, come in and they're like, well, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I don't really like law now. What's your other option? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, because you get boxed into these title jobs. I mean, especially from the Caribbean. We don't know of the job unless, you know, master had it at some point. Right. So it's these defined roles. And it's be creative. You know, my mm -hmm. sister's a filmmaker. Nobody who thinks that Jamaica would be a filmmaker, you know, mm -hmm. this little girl, how do you make films? Yeah. But just be creative, be honest with yourself about what you like, uh, read, mm -hmm. read, read everything, everything you can get your hands on. Um, know your history, know what you're about, you know, mm -hmm. because without it, you won't know where you're going. Without your history, you don't know about you. where you're going, Marcus Garvey, your countryman, yeah. that was part of very, very important aspect and yeah. of, of his philosophy. Yeah. Dr. Stacy Ann Wilson, it's Thank a pleasure you so much. talking with you. Um, the next time I pass through, we're going to have part two of, oh um, <laughs> of this discussion because I really do enjoy it as um, um, someone who's getting up now in age. I, <laughs> I like to see you young people really um, carrying, carrying so on. So this means I have to do that when I get up in age? Is that what happens? Well, <laughs> yes, you have to pass the baton, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm up for the job. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Well, I do hope you found this program uh, quite interesting. Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Wilson brings to bear on this subject fresh insight and analysis. Until the next time, this is David Hines thanking you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation. And remember, as always, our motto here on this program is one people, one culture, one nation, one Caribbean.